Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your way, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know, as we just sang, I will trust in the Lord. The decision we make, he asks us to choose to trust in him. And there are times when it may not always be simple, it may not always be easy, but he asks us to trust in him. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but he asks us to trust in him. Sometimes we don't know what the future holds, but he asks us to trust in him. You know, I'm reminded of 11 years ago when we first pulled into a city called Goodyear, Arizona. Our family all together moved into Arizona. We, knew, we didn't know anybody. We had no idea how we were going to prepare for our son's needs and for our, our daughter's schooling, and, and we, we did not know. But God called us as missionaries to American Indian College we chose to trust. And because of that, I believe he blessed us incredibly with wonderful, many wonderful things. God blessed us with friends. Many in the church here have supported us and, and wrapped their arms around us in, in the good times and in the tough times. Um, the, the, the loss of our dear son, Gregory. You were there. You cared for us. You wrapped your arms around us. And we thank you for that. Trust. Time and time again, I feel God has asked me to trust. And this next step is a step of trust. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy leaving the friends that God has placed in my heart, but we will stay in touch. Believe me, we will. Through texting, through calls, we will stay in touch. Please, please continue to pray for us. Thank you for loving us, and thank you for honoring us today. Thought I was going to have to sit down there for a minute and just let Ruth preach. <laughs> now, a lot of people don't know this yet. But uh, Ruth now is a licensed minister. So, yeah. so from now on, it's Reverend Ruth. So we're thrilled about the opportunities, obviously, but it's always bittersweet to leave, leave folks. But this is the longest we've ever lived in one place in my life, ever. So <laughs> weird. Um, and uh, God is with us. So we will pray for you. God is doing something in this community. God is building a church, and it looks just the way he wants it. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. Do you have your Bibles? Turn with me to the starting point of the message today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. You know, today marks the beginning of what many Christians around the world observe as Holy Week. It kicks off with the festive, praise-filled expressions of Palm Sunday. We've done some of that here today. I I, when I was pastoring, I always made a big deal about Palm Sunday, and I was always frustrated because in northern Illinois, the weather's rarely good on Palm Sunday. And I always wanted to go out and do something, and we would, it might have been snowing or raining or cold and windy or something, and we got frustrated a lot with that. But to be able to just say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Praise the Lord. As Jesus' disciples gathered around him and then led him into Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry. Just a little preview of the kingship of Jesus Christ. This Holy Week moves on. If you read through the story in the Gospels, you find that 
Uh, it's about on Thursday when Jesus observes the Last Supper with his disciples. And then on Friday is that, that at the same time wonderful and horrible thing in which Jesus bears his cross to Calvary. And he dies. Placed in a grave. And then suddenly, it's Resurrection Day on Sunday morning. He's alive. The tomb is empty. I love this Holy Week expression and this observance. And I encourage you this week. By the way, the, if you do the version thing or Bible.com, I, I just discovered they sent me an email this morning that they've got a seven-day, starts tomorrow, they have a seven-day Bible reading plan for Easter week. You might check that out or, or go to one of the Gospels or all of the Gospels yourself this week and just, and, and just, just read. Take a, a little bit a day, every day or twice a day, maybe in the morning and the evening, or maybe you can slip away at your lunch hour. And just read a little bit. Walk through Jesus in this Holy Week expression. Get on the emotional roller coaster <laughs> and allow the Word of God to change you this week. You know, throughout history, there have been moments perhaps they lasted just for a few minutes or a second that have changed the world they've changed everything because everything after that moment was different and our nation's history dates like september 11th 2001 we remember don't we some of us that maybe are a little older or really good history students remember December 6th, 1941. Or November 22nd, 1963. When the terrorists attack New York City and Washington. Pearl Harbor Day. The assassination of JFK. Those dates, those moments, they last just, just a little bit. But afterwards, everything was different. In your life and in your family, there were those moments where things changed. After that millisecond, after that day, after that event, after that loss, after that birth, after that gift, after that, that surprise, everything was different in your life and in your family. For a few moments this morning, let's focus our attention on what I believe is the single most important turning point in history. The event that altered human history and eternity. And it happened during Holy Week as we look toward the end of the week. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. From that event emerges perhaps the most enduring symbol of the Christian faith. The cross. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, let us just soak in this word about the cross today. It has changed our lives. It's changed human history Change us a little bit more today, in Jesus' name. The cross changed everything. And can I say it? The cross still changes everything. In fact, no matter whatever's going on in your life, the cross can change it. Whatever's going on in your family, the cross can change it. Whatever's happening in our nation, the cross can change it. Whatever's happening in this world, the cross can change it. The cross changes everything. We could go on and on about what the cross has done. And in fact, my, my official title now, I, gotta, I have, a, uh, I have a, my title at um, Global University is Professor of Theology and Missions. I won't bore you and put my theology hat on today. But literally, we could probably take a whole semester's course on a theology of the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What, what has it done? What has it accomplished? We'll just look at a couple of things this morning. Jesus, the cross, Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty 
for my sin. Paul reminds us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, and every single one of us was born in sin. The wages of that sin, we, every one of us, deserves to die. But Jesus Christ paid that penalty. When he hung on the cross, he paid it off our debt. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 says this in the but his son became a human and died so God made peace with you and now he lets you stand in his presence as people who are holy and faultless and innocent not only did Jesus pay the penalty for my sin he made me right he purified me. He changed me. He says, now we are a people who stand in the presence of God because of the cross of Christ. We stand in his presence and we are holy. We don't hope to be holy. We are holy. Amen. We are faultless in his blood because he hang on the, hung on the cross and we stand innocent before him. And Paul reminds us, all this is from God through Christ who reconciled us to himself. Oh, we are reconciled to Christ because of that penalty. We were estranged from him. It was like we, we were divorced from God. We were cut off from him. And we couldn't reach back and find him because we were sinners. Yet God in Christ Jesus built that bridge and he shed his blood and he reconciled us. He brought us back into wholeness and oneness in him. We're reconciled. Jesus' death makes it possible for the Holy Spirit to come into my life. Let all the house of Israel, Peter said, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the penalty is paid. We're reconciled to God. And now, one more incredible step in this process is now the Holy Spirit, God himself, dwells within us. All because of the cross. And then it says, to underline what Peter says, God has made him both Lord and Christ. The fourth thing is that Jesus' death gave him the absolute right to govern my life. He is Lord and Christ. It means he's the one, he came, he suffered and died. And then when he rose again, he becomes the Lord, the absolute ruler. Say, so nobody has the right to govern my life. Oh, yeah. Jesus does. God himself gave Jesus the right to govern my life. Because of the cross, I don't live for myself anymore. And that's an incredible good thing. <laughs> Jesus, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. You say, no one's, I don't bow my knee to anybody. You will. You will. Every knee will bow. So, the cross changes everything. Do you remember that classic Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Which, by the way, wasn't released as a Christmas movie. It came out in July. In fact, they didn't want to bill it. As a, they, you look through the, the old hand, you know, the handbills and the posters and stuff, there's not a breath of Christmas in it because they released it in July. It really wasn't about Christmas. What the movie is about is about 
what would happen if you had never lived? And you think about George Bailey. And he said, as, as his guardian angel told him at the end of the film, he says, you've been given a great gift, George. I know a lot of lines from that movie. I've watched it a lot. <laughs> you've been given a great gift, George, because you've had the opportunity to see what would have happened had you not been born. Now take that and just magnify it a million times and try to imagine what had happened had Jesus not been born. Had Jesus not lived. Had Jesus not died and risen again. Wow. George Bailey found that the world was a lot darker place because he hadn't been in it. And he was just one guy. Imagine if God had not sent Jesus Christ, what this world would be like today. It would be a dark, lonely, awful place. My heart it would be a dark, lonely, and awful place. But he did come. And he did die. And he changed everything when he died on the cross cross changed everything. One of my favorite passages in all the scripture is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ changed everything. He changed you. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that good news? So my past has been changed. I've been changed. And because my past has been changed and I'm a different person, then my present is different. Anybody like to watch Star Trek? Don't they travel? In every episode, they travel in time, it seems. Because something went wrong in the past, and they got to fix it in the present. Or something went wrong in the present, and they got to go to the past to change it again. The cross changes my present. Now, we've already discovered the cross pays a penalty that was far beyond my ability to pay. I can't pay my sin debt. A few months ago, I had the privilege of speaking here, and we talked about that. I can't possibly earn enough. The richest man in the world can't pay his sin debt. It doesn't even begin to pay. When I came to faith in Christ, he paid it then. When I came to Christ, when I professed my faith in him, that debt was applied to my account. Jesus Christ hung on the cross for me. He bought me back. He redeemed me. Now, often we theologize that because Jesus died on the cross, I don't have to. His cross eliminated mine. Well, that's kind of true. But there's more to it than that. Because there is a cross. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there remains a cross for the follower of Christ. The cross of the disciple, if you will. And the cross of discipleship is for me to carry. He carried and died and was died and was killed, crucified on the cross of redemption. But there's a cross of discipleship. Now, let me just clear this up. Cross-bearing discipleship is tough to market. Right? In a selfie world, we talked about that before church today, didn't we? They've, apparently, someone's done a study that, that selfish people take selfies. Somewhere, somebody earned a PhD because he wrote a dissertation on the psychology of selfies, probably. <laughs> I 
That's a tough sell. But Jesus says, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Let's, let's back up a second, take another run at that one. And if you do not, I'll, I'll read it real slow. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And he goes even further. Don't begin until you count the cost. Now, I probably, we could probably just read that verse, let it soak in a little bit, and say, Amen. Let's, let's go eat. In the church in America today, there is an incredible pressure on leaders and church members like yourself to soften the edges, scale down the terms of discipleship, because this is this is it's it's hard to market. It it, it you know it doesn't tweet well. I don't know if anybody follows us on Facebook or anything, but I've been trying um, to tweet the cross in these weeks leading up to Easter. There's this pressure because in our culture, we've got to be bigger, richer, more powerful, cooler. Those are all the, the pressures that we feel in a selfie culture. Because, and those are the things that get rewarded in this culture. So there's, there's pressure to modify the terms of disciple just a little, discipleship just a little bit. You know, no, no, Coke never advertises the the problems that you'll have when you... Coke is a wonderful life. Oh, you drink that Coke and the, the water beads up on the glass bottle and the beautiful woman occurs, appears and, and, you know, life is just... The world comes together because you're drinking a Coke. It doesn't tell you all that sugar you're drinking is going to turn straight to fat. You see, in our culture, in many ways, the culture has discipled us. They said, it's, it's the good life, right? It's the good life. In America, we have this thing called the American dream. You know, 2.3 kids, it keeps shrinking, 2.1 now. Maybe, I think it's down to 1.7 maybe. Kids and a nice home and, and a brand new car and, and all, all this. And it gets... For one, it gets harder and harder to maintain all that, doesn't it? As I think there's a little problem there because as the cost of houses and cars go up, the number of children begin to shrink. Hmm. I, won't, I won't go down that little rabbit trail. <laughs> we have this, the good life. But you, can I tell you today, I, I will because I'm leaving town. By the way, we're, we're, we're moving a week from Monday. We're going to be here. We're going to load the truck on Saturday. We're going to come to church here on Easter Sunday. And then early Monday morning, probably before the sun's even up, we'll be on our way to Missouri. Lord, help me as I drive that truck. It's eternal life that matters. The good life actually is kind of irrelevant. Because the, the best life that you can get on this planet ends the moment you die. It's over. It's eternal life that really matters. And Jesus loves you far too much to let you off with a moderate discipleship. He's not, not going to let you go that easy. You see, if, if my flesh wants to set the terms of discipleship, this is how I'll follow Christ. Well, is that even discipleship at all? Hmm. 
To be a true disciple, then, I have to renounce everything but Jesus and the kingdom of God. I was struck by something. I've been reading a lot in the Gospels over the last couple of years. And in Matthew, that well-known passage says, Seek first the kingdom of God. And, and that has lent us a lot because I think that's the more familiar passage to us. And we think, well, the kingdom of God is a matter of priority. Uh, Luke says it differently, though. As Luke records the words of Jesus, he simply says, seek the kingdom of God. Hmm. Seek the kingdom of God. Ironically, if, see, if, we're, if, we're af if we're after the good life instead of eternal life, then we've missed the target completely. Why is that important? Because if we've confused the target, we find ourselves as the people of God with this mandate to fix the world. Right? Go make disciples of all nations. But if the nations have discipled us first, then we find ourselves in this dilemma that we're trying to fix the world that we've already become like. How's that going to turn out? I'll dig just a little deeper. To follow Jesus, eternal life requires not a selfie attitude, but a death to self. Maybe we should coin a new term here today. Death to selfie. See, Paul defines death to self. What does that mean, to die to self? Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I Live by faith. Now, a lot of times we've used that term when we say, well, I'm, we're, we're trusting and we're just kind of believing that God's going to be with us and bring in supply and all that. And, and that's a, a good interpretation of it. But I believe it goes even farther than that. And that is that when we live by faith, we no longer, it's not like we live with faith. We live by faith. You get the difference? Because if we want to set the terms of our discipleship, then a lot of times what we want to do is we want to attach a little faith box. A little add-on piece. Optional equipment. We'll just add a little faith box to my life, and then, then that'll kind of straighten out and help me and keep me going. We want a little faith box. No, we don't add a little faith box to our life. It's a new life. It's an exchange. We don't live with faith. We live by faith. A total replacement, just not an add-on unit. Jesus will not fix your life. He will change it. He'll give you a new one. Now, if you're willing to just tinker around the edges, you can go ahead and try that, and we'll see how that works. By the way, dying to self is a good thing. <laughs> well, it's easy for us sometimes to, to uh, oh, we get martyr complex about being Christian. Oh, I'm just crucifying my flesh. If it, if, it, if it feels good, I can't do it. If it feels bad, I better. You know, somehow there's, a, there's this massive penalty. Again, we can't pay the penalty. We're not paying for anything. We're not somehow making ourselves deliberately uncomfortable or crucifying ourselves somehow so that we can measure up to God's goodness. You try that and see how that works. It isn't going to. It's not going to work that way. What we're doing is we're exchanging the old dead self for a brand new live one. That's pretty cool. 
Whoever does not take his cross, Jesus says, and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Take that selfie. Bye. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoa. <laughs> you seen those zombie movies? If you want to keep living like that, go ahead. But I don't want to be walking around in death. That nothing that I eat satisfies. No pleasure endures. Nothing fills the empty spot. Not going to work that way. You got to be alive. You got to find new life in Jesus Christ. Your food will taste better. Everything will get better. You see, when you die to self, you're not changing your DNA, really. You're, that, that remains unchanged. It's your spirit that comes alive. So long as you live by and for self, it's a living death. But if you can allow the self to be crucified with Christ, you're going to find what it truly means to be alive. And don't forget that on the other side of the cross is an empty tomb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The cross changes everything. It changes my past by God's forgiveness. It gives me authentic life to live in this present. And it gives us hope for a future beyond the evil and darkness of this corrupted world. This wonderful, indescribable, life-giving message is ours to share. The Great Commission. We fulfill the Great Commission by becoming cross-bearing disciples and reproducing the same. Look at it. We're going to read it carefully in Luke chapter 24 and verse 46. What time is it? 11.57. Oh, we're just going to go eat, right? <laughs> it's my last Sunday. I'm leaving. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Did, did you look at that? One sentence and we've got the Christ will die, he'll rise from the dead and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed. The Holy Trinity there. The death, the resurrection, the Great Commission is in one sentence in Luke's Gospel. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And God, through the Holy Spirit, is going to give us the power to get all that done. Here's Matthew's version of the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in, on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The cross. The cross compels us to go. That's missions. The cross compels us to go. That's why we go. You take the cross out of this thing and the cross from my life, I'm not a missionary. It's the cross. It's a handy reminder in English that the first two letters of the gospel are go. To the Son, the Father said in heaven, go, live among men, tell the story, die. I'll raise you again. And to the disciples, Jesus says, go, make disciples of them. Take this message everywhere. You see, the Lord wants every, everybody, every single person to know the power of the cross and the glory of the resurrection. You know, using the analogy of harvest, he sends workers into the harvest field. That's a good little segue into the piece I forgot to talk about a minute ago, more than a minute ago. I hope everybody got this little green and white card. 
It's got two sides to it. On the front of it, you're supposed to put your name and your email address if you want to get turn this in. And then on the back, there's, there's a place to check. We mentioned it in the video just a little bit, that God is sending the workforce to reap the harvest. It says, he, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. We need workers in the harvest field. And Jesus said that. He, it's amazing how I've, I've gone so long and just hadn't really taken that all this seriously. I don't want to talk about the Lord send laborers. But this is important. The most important piece of the harvest God is impressing in my heart is to pray and to ask for God to send laborers into the harvest field. So we've been doing that. Every, every Wednesday I've, I've set aside as pray for laborers day. And, we're at, and the Lord impressed us to ask for people to join us. So that's what this little card is. If you want to check that middle box, weekly reminder to pray for laborers, on Wednesday we'll send, out, we'll send you an email to remind you. If you want to join that prayer force of praying for laborers for the harvest, do that. And the other one's self-explanatory. We'll also send you our newsletter, ministry updates, and blog posts if you want to get on those, those mailing lists as well. But you know what? Those missionaries that are going to be raised out of Armenia to be sent into the Middle East, every one of those Middle Eastern companies, someone's praying for them. Someone has prayed for them. That, it might have been someone 1,500 years ago. We don't know. Someone is praying for them. It's, in our generation, it's on us to stand up and say, Lord, send harvesters into the, into the harvest field today, tomorrow, and in the next generation. Send laborers. So join us, if you will. You see, missions isn't the work of missionaries. It's the work of the church. We're the edge of the blade as missionaries. But missions is the work of the church. We all go. When we go to Armenia, we go to Cuba or China, Vietnam, any of the other countries, that we, you're going with us whether you like it or not. But the cross also compels us to testify. That's witness. Missions, we go. Witness, we stay. And we do both of those. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven witness now this idea of witness can be a terrifying idea to some i want to ask you to raise your hand there unless you want to is that, have you found witnessing to be difficult or a scary idea to you many of us if we were honest we'd raise our hand oh that's, that makes me i get scared about that but you know jesus said let your light shine see those light bulbs all over the place they are not a bit scared. Why? They're just shining. Jesus didn't say, make your light shine. He's built the fire. He's put the energy there. Just let your light shine. Take the cover off and you're good. That's what witness is all about. Live your life of faith. Put a smile on your faith and trust in God and live a holy life and have fun doing it. Yes, sir. Witness. You won't, have, you won't have to get out the four spiritual laws and get them in the right order. People will be flocking to you. Let your light shine. Don't worry about whether they, they like the message or not. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He's big enough to handle that one. Our role in witnessing is just to shine and tell our story to people who want to listen to it. Live the life of faith that Christ has given you. Let your light shine. The only way to avoid being a witness is to hide that light. So the cross compels us to go in missions. It compels us to testify as we witness but it also compels us to worship. To worship. And that's why we're going to end the service by observing communion in just a moment. In fact, I think you guys can come that are going to play a little music. And, um, you know, the triumphal entry. 
this Holy Week is a fascinating thing because on Palm Sunday, we've got the palm branches waving, the people yelling and screaming, Hosanna to the Son of David! It says it's the disciples of Jesus, and they're lifting up their voices, and they're praising God, and it stirs the whole city. And by the end of the week, we got sneering, jeering, hateful people saying, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! And it reminds us that those two choruses, they're still going on today, aren't they? We're here today as the people of God, and we're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there are people out there who are opposed to God. They're agents of darkness. And they're raising the other one. They're fighting against this great light, trying to extinguish it with darkness. And we live in the, in the tension between those two in this world. But as we gather around the communion table and we celebrate the death of Jesus Christ, as Jesus himself told us, he says, I will not drink it again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I take that to mean that Jesus, this, was a, this is a portion of the Passover, the Seder that survives in the Christian church. And I believe that what Jesus means by that is when we all sit down together in heaven, when the harvest is in, it's all gathered. We're going to sit down and we're going to observe this again. And that day, all the, opponent, all the opponents, all the opposing voices, that whole chorus of darkness will be gone forever. And it will just be pure, unadulterated, the bright light of God's glory. And we'll be worshiping Jesus forever. All because of the cross. Hallelujah. Let's